A little cold out there for boating, isn't it? Yeah. So I call it the Green Leaf Challenge. It happened back when I lived in Williamsburg. My brother and I, we thought we had the whole block sewed up because I was on uh, staff at the Baptist Church at one end of the block, and he was the bartender at the other end of the block. So we just thought we had it all worked out. And of course, I spent a lot of time in his establishment. I wanted to kind of get to know the, uh, the regulars there. And, and as time went on, well, I remember my brother finally came to me and said, look, I'll make a deal with you. If you won't preach in my bar, I won't serve drinks in your church. So we sort of had to have an agreement there. But I really enjoyed learning and, and, uh, and kind of looking into the lives of some of the folks that sort of hung out there all the time. And one day, one of the guys just really let me have it. He just, I mean, hit me right between the eyes with, uh, you guys down at the church think you got relationships all figured out. You ain't got nothing compared to what we got here. You talk about it all the time, like you got all these close relationships. Let me tell you, we take the shirt off of each other's back around here. And I knew he was telling the truth. I mean, when one of them moved, they were all there to help pack the truck. When, um, I mean, I saw them loan money to each other and not really expecting to get it back. I got to see them as they encouraged each other and try to uh, kind of, you know, help, help each other through the hard times of life. Now, luckily, I mean, if this had happened a couple of years before that, I wouldn't have had anything to point at. But by this time, I had my lifeboat that I could point at. You see, I was part of a group of guys. There was only five of us. Um, and we had, well, we'd kind of come together in school. We were all in grad school together. And uh, we all liked lifting weights. And so we were, uh, well, we kind of gathered in the, in the basement of the gym. Now, the basement of the gym there, I don't think every, anybody had ever really been down there in at least 1,000 years. It was so packed with dust, it was amazing. It was mostly just a big, huge storage closet with all this junk everywhere. But there was this little section about the size of this part of the stage here that was uh, the weight room. And it was partitioned off with two by fours. I started to say walled off, but it really wasn't because it was just the two by fours for a wall with um, uh, chicken wire wrapped all the way around it. So you were in a cage. And they had. Uh, they had one weight bench, and they had a couple of this and that, but not much. Well, the five of us kind of ended up being down there a lot, like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoon, and we'd spot each other, and we'd push each other to lift a little more. And then one day, I mean, our, the friendships grew, of course, as they do in that kind of situation. But one day, one of them, I can't remember who, said, uh, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Now, that was kind of a funny question because we, I mean, the youngest of us was in the middle 20s. Uh, one of us had already been to Vietnam and back. So, I mean, we weren't, uh, to talk about when you grow up, we should have been there by then. But we weren't. We were still in grad school and doing that kind of thing. But anyway, we thought about that. And I, I think it was Bill that said, you know what I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a man of God. That's what I really want to be. Well, we were all in seminary. We were all studying for the ministry and as we kind of went around the room and uh, we all said, yeah, that describes pretty much what we want to be. We want to be men of God. And so somebody at that point said, well, why don't we do that together? Why don't we help one another become that? Just like we're down here in the weight room and we push each other to push a little more, to, to lift a little more, to do more, one more rep. Why don't we push each other to be more men of God? And so we... Uh, kind of got in that mode. And it really changed the conversation. I mean, we're still down there three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the afternoon. But the conversation changed to what's the next thing you need to grow in Christ, to, to become more of a man of God. And we began to push each other in that. Then somebody had the ridiculous idea that that wasn't enough that we needed to get up at, and meet together every Wednesday morning at six o'clock and pray together. And, you know, that was a, I mean, we were in school. You know, when you're in school, you're just barely able to get up in time for class, much less get up at six in the morning to pray with. But we did it. Uh, I guess all of us were just too pious to say, no, I'm not going to do that. So we did it. But anyway, the friendships developed, uh, the relationships developed. We became more and more interwoven. But the threshold happened when we decided we were going to go over to um, Nags Head, you know, with the Outer Banks. We were in the middle of North Carolina, and uh, Anthony, his uh, parents had a place right on the water 
uh, and had a boat. So we were going to go to his place, uh, take the boat over across the sound, over to the Outer Banks, and spend the day and then come back. Good plan. Got in the little tiny boat. The motor got us halfway across, and then it died. And there we sat, and Anthony said, no worries. There's a lot of traffic through here. Just a matter of time before somebody comes along and tows us in. It was five hours. Five hours. We were stuck in this little boat. Of course, there were no paddles. We tried that hand thing, you know, uh, but it wasn't that kind of boat. It wasn't going to work like that. Well, the boat, as the day went on, got smaller and smaller. I'm pretty sure it was really getting smaller. And, um, you know, the sun was beating down on us. It was salt water, so you had that salty crust on you. And those guys that had been so nice and so wonderful, well, frankly, they just got nasty as the day went on. In fact, Bill got so obnoxious that I just picked him up and threw him out of the boat. The other guys helped him back in. They let him back in. I mean, if we took a vote on that, I'd have voted against that because, I mean, he was really being obnoxious. And then we got on each other's nerves. There was yelling. There was oh, all kinds of junk. But I don't know exactly what happened. But after we got our toe in and after, as we got out of that boat, there was something different about us. We were more than buddies. We were like a unit. We were like a force. It was amazing. Well, you know, that happened a long, long time ago. I think it was 77, somewhere around now. Well, you know, to this day, if I have a problem at 2 o'clock in the morning, I can get on the phone, and I know within two hours, Jay will be at my front door because Jay lives about an hour and a half away. I'm going to give him a little time in the middle of the night, you know, to get dressed. I also know that within four hours, most of the others will be at my house. Now, Bill, Bill probably won't be there. He's, uh, well, he lives in Indonesia, and, and frankly, he never was that committed to us anyway, you know? But man, it's great to be a part of a group like that. You know, non-Christians, when they look at uh, us believers, they're mystified by our clustering. They see us as cluster maniacs. In fact, somebody has said, if you take 10 Christians and you put them in a, a ballroom with a thousand other people, it won't be an hour before they find each other and you'll see them in one little corner kind of talking to each other and sharing and uh, telling their war stories with one another. It's just kind of what we do. I remember one guy saying to me one time, well, all you talk about is your Monday night group. I don't get it. All you do is sit around. What's the big deal? And if that's not enough, a couple of times a week, you sneak off to get with one of them for lunch. Don't you get enough of that on Sundays? Well, he just doesn't understand, does he? We are cluster maniacs. Now, theologians, they have words for this. They, they use the word community. And community actually means, uh, well, it means being interwoven. It means uh, having a sense of belonging. You see, it's about relationships. And frankly, relationships is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to Christianity. If your Christianity isn't affecting your relationships in a positive way, I kind of have to wonder whether you're, uh, well, if you're even a believer or not. I did a sermon series. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this sermon series here. But I did a, a 51-week sermon series on relationships. That's almost, well, that's a year. And about three months after it was over, I remember Joyce said to me, she said, you know, I really thought that was a little bit of overkill. 51 weeks on relationships. But she said, you know, I've come to realize that relationships is what it's all about. Another word we use for this clustering thing is called fellowship. Fellowship is the New Testament word. It's, the, it's what the New Testament calls this thing, fellowship. It's the word koinonia in Greek. It's a very strong word. Now, what's interesting to me is that we kind of throw that word around a lot. We'll have a little uh, dinner down at the church, and we'll call it a fellowship meal. But actually, that word is a lot stronger than that. It means a lot more than that. Dick Woodward, who's a pastor, he says, uh, well, the best definition he knows of of fellowship is two fellows on the same ship. I kind of like that. 
In fact, he tells the story of going to see a lady in the hospital that went to his church. Uh, her husband didn't go to church, but she did, and she was really, really sick. And so he gets to the hospital, and the woman says, look, I would really appreciate it if you talk to my husband. He is taking this really hard. And uh, he's downstairs. He's outside right now. He's, he's getting a smoke. If you could just go down and talk to him. So he goes down, and he starts to talk to this man who's, who's smoking his cigarette, and, and um and, the man, and he's trying to explain to this man, I want to walk through this with you. I want to kind of uh, be with you through this, this situation. Uh, and then he said, what we call it, we call it fellowship. And fellowship is two fellows in the same ship. And he said the guy looked at him for a minute, took in a big puff of smoke, blew it out and said, well, then row, damn it. <laughs> you know, that really is a good definition of it. Because not only do we get in the boat together and do life together, but we row. We work on it together. Now, you can call it whatever you want to call it, if table. That's pretty good. I'm probably not going to call mine that because, frankly, I'm, I'm just not that gender, okay? But I call them lifeboats. And I call them lifeboats, well, because my group started, it crossed that threshold in a little boat. But it's also about being small. It's only a few people. It's not a whole lot of people. But I tell you, once you are in a lifeboat, you don't want to do life without it. In fact, if you're not in one right now, and frankly, I'm concerned, because there are large numbers of Christians that are going through this life without a lifeboat. And if you're not in one, well, you don't know what you're missing. Well, let me change that. Let me say it like this. You got a treat coming. You got a treat coming. I went on a retreat one time when I first, when God first became important to me, uh, some, some guys asked me to go on this men's retreat. And so it was a Friday through Sunday thing. It was the whole weekend. And uh, I signed up for it and I went and, and we got there Friday afternoon and I unpacked my bags. We kind of set ourselves up in our bedrooms, you know, and then we came out and we stood around and we talked and we talked and we talked and then we had dinner, thank goodness, and then we talked and we talked and finally I said, you know, when's the program going to start? When's the speaker going to come out? When, when, when are we going to start the agenda? And I remember he looked at me and went, there's no agenda. We're just here to hang out. And being the A-type personality that I am, I said, well, let's hang out in a hurry so I can get back and get to doing something that's going to matter. Well, at that point, his friend, who I'd never met before, Cortez, kind of took me over in one corner, and he gave me a seminary degree on lifeboats. He pointed out to me that Jesus had his lifeboat. Whenever Jesus went through a significant event in his life, there was Peter, James, and John. It was the four of them, always it was the four of them. He had his lifeboat. He had his disciples. He had the multitudes, but he had his lifeboat. Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. That was it. He showed me how Paul, Paul always had Silas and Luke and Barnabas and Timothy. They were his lifeboat. In fact, the one time he gets stuck in prison without them, he's going, man, I wish you guys were here. Isn't that something terrible thing to say? I want my friends in jail with me. He longed to be with them always. The early church, I mean, right after the church, right after Pentecost, right after the church got started, it says in the book of Acts chapter 2 that the church met together daily. Well, by that time, there was at least 5,000 people that belonged to the church. Do you think they all gathered in one room? I mean, they didn't even have buildings that held that many people back then. Of course not. They met in small groups of people, supporting each other and pushing one another. All through the New Testament, you see where, where the, the, the church of that day was house churches. They didn't have big buildings. They gathered in small groups places. Even in Rome, when the persecution really got bad, when Christians had to hide for their lives, they would sneak down into the sewer system of Rome it's called the catacombs, and they'd meet down there just so they could get together. And that was dangerous business back then. In fact, I talked to somebody that had just been to those catacombs. I said, so is there any big rooms? He says, no, there are no big rooms. They're all pretty small. 
you might be able to cram 15 people into one of them. But man, they'd risk their life to come together. Because frankly, this is not an option. As you read the New Testament, it becomes really clear. In Christianity, there are no lone rangers. Christianity is a team sport. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, don't forsake the assembling of your others. If you grew up in church, you probably heard him say that. That meant come to church every week. That's what we used it for. But that's not what this verse is about. It says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself. Make sure you get together. In fact, it goes on to say, spur one another to good deeds. It says, encourage one another. I really believe, I believe, I mean, I believe this down and deep in my bones, that if we're going to grow spiritually, it's going to be in the context of a lifeboat. I mean, where else are you going to get the accountability, the, the counsel, the motivation? You know, the reveal survey that um, came out a few years ago really rocked the church because basically it went and it interviewed uh, church people all over. And the bottom line was, is even those these people that went to every church event, they weren't growing spiritually. And the bottom line of that survey is this, if you're going to grow spiritually, it's up to you. It's not up to the church. It's up to you. And frankly, I don't think you can grow spiritually unless you're a part of a group of people who have made it their goal to push one another to grow in Christ. I feel so strongly about this that I wrote a book about it. And when I wrote the book, I knew that I was going to have to include a section on the euphoric moments, you know, those times of ecstasy, because there are going to be times where you're laughing so hard, your side's going to split open. There's going to be awesome adventures that you have together. One time I, uh, I took a youth group. It was one van, so this might, might have been 13 teenagers. Uh, we went on a mission trip, and we went from northern Virginia down to the peninsula uh, Newport News, Hampton area, and um, the mission trip was to help the blind. So for a whole week, we took the blind scuba diving, we took them to the beach, we took them to bush gardens, uh, we took them bicycle riding. You want to talk about something that's really interesting? If you don't have tandem bikes and you take the blind bicycle riding, that's really interesting. But we did that for a whole week. But the problem was is that this was down in an area where I used to live, and I had one of my old lifeboats lived down there. And so I remember calling Chuck and Josie and saying, man, I'm going to be in your area, but I've got these kids, and I got to, you know, you kind of got to keep an eye on teenagers, and so I can't really leave them, uh, but man, I'd love to get with y'all. And I said, hey, no problem. We got a pool at our house. I said, great. So we, one night, we went over there, the kids went out and swam in the pool, you know, the, they called all the old members of the life group, we were sitting in this den, there was a big picture window, so we could act like we were watching the kids in the pool, you know, and, uh, but we were just, you know how, how it is when you get with friends and you hadn't been with them for a while, but well, we started telling our old stories, our old war stories, our adventures we'd had together, we were laughing and we were picking on, hey Mike, remember that time, blah, 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 you know, we were just doing that kind of stuff. Well, I was having a great time, but the kids, I mean, they started getting cold, they started getting tired, so as the evening wore on, they started drifting in one at a time. The first kid comes in with a towel wrapped around him, he sits down in the corner, and another kid comes in and sits in another corner, and they start hitting, you know, I mean, we're, we're taking up all the chairs, so all they got to do is sit on the ground, and, and they start sitting on the stairs that go up, you know, they're all, the stairs starts to fill up, and, and after a while I realize they're all in there, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I got to get these kids out of here. Nothing more dangerous than bored teenagers, am I right? <laughs> Nothing more dangerous. And so I'm thinking, I got to get these kids out of here. Plus, it, it, we've had a hard week. I need to get them back to the hotel. Um, and, but I just having too much fun, you know, and it's all about me. So heck with the kids. So, we, you know, we stayed and we laughed and we talked and we laughed. And I kept saying, I got to get them out of here. Finally, about, uh, I think it was about midnight, we finally wrapped it up. And I said, all right, all right, let's, let's get these kids out of here. We went back to the hotel. 
Uh, well, the next morning, I mean, that was the end of the mission trip. So the next morning we're heading back. So we load all the kids in the van and, and we're, you know, all youth workers on the way back from those kind of things. They do what youth workers do. It's called debriefing. And so uh, I'm driving and I'm saying, I, you know, I'm one of the first questions. So what was the best part of the week for you? Was it when we went to Bush Gardens? That was fun. When we took the, the blind kids scuba diving, that was pretty cool. What was the best part? And then the van got real quiet. And you could hear them thinking, you know. And finally, one of them said, the best part was last night. Listening to you guys tell your stories. And one by one, they all came to the conclusion that that was the best part of the week. You know, I thought I was born, I'm silly. But what I was doing for those kids was I was modeling for them what Christianity is all about. So I knew I was going to have to write a chapter on those euphoric moments. I also knew when I wrote this book, I was going to have to include a section on the pain. Because frankly, when you try to do life together with people, there's going to be the misunderstandings. There's going to be the mistakes. There's going to be the harsh words. There's going to be the bruised egos. It's just going to happen. In fact, part of our Christian growth is learning how to work through those things. I think one of the most painful moments for me was when Anthony, you know, that original group, the one that started in the cage, um, he called us all over to his apartment one day and he said, I've decided to throw the towel in on Christianity. I'm leaving the faith. I'm leaving school tomorrow. I'm not going to give you all a forwarding address. I'm all, I want you to promise me that you won't try to track me down because frankly, I can't make that kind of decision with you guys in my life. That was a hard night. What was interesting to me is as I stumbled, and I, I think I stumbled out of his apartment, I wasn't thinking about the theology of it. I wasn't thinking about apostasy. I wasn't thinking about how can you taste the goodness of the Lord and, and walk away. All I could think about is that once we were five, and now we were four. So I'd have to write a chapter, and I did, on the pain. Also, in my book, I knew I was going to have to write a chapter on the purpose. You see, the purpose of a lifeboat, and this is what makes it different than a set of friends. You've kind of moved from the friendship and you've sort of added to that, that we're going to spur one another on to grow in Christ. That's the purpose. You see, in a lifeboat, you, you mold one another, you shape one another, you push one another to grow in your faith. I mean, without the purpose, it's just a nice little group. You just sit around and have tea and cookies. And frankly, who's got time for that? I don't. But man, when you're a part of a group, when you've got a lifeboat, when you're sitting in that meeting and one of them leans forward and looks you in the eye and says, you know, nine out of 10 men would have taken the easy route. Nine out of 10 men would have taken the way of least resistance. But you, man, you stepped up to the plate you did the right thing. Way to go. And there's nothing like that. Got a call one night from one of the guys in my lifeboat, and he, uh, he said, man, I'm in trouble. My wife has taken the kids, and she's gone to see her parents. For the next two weeks, they're going to be three states away. And there's a girl at the office that has let me know that if I want her, I can have her. He says, man, I don't know what to do. I can't get it out of my head. So being the pious, wonderful friend that I was, I said, well, don't worry. I will pray for you. And then I hung up. Of course, what I did next was I got on the phone to the rest of the guys in the lifeboat, and I said, he's in trouble. Well, for the next two weeks, he had breakfast with one of us, lunch with one of us, dinner with one of us. Every night about 9 o'clock, I'd call and say, what are you doing, boy? Remember later, he said, you guys saved my life. You saved my marriage. Because I probably wouldn't have made it through those two weeks. 
also wrote a chapter in my book about lifeboats, about the, uh, the confrontation. Because it happens. In my lifeboats, we've worked on our language, we've worked on our money management, we've worked on our time management. There's nothing like the accountability of that kind of group. But I've I got to say here, let me just throw this in, won't cost you any extra, that accountability can really get sick at times. So we've kind of made a rule in our life, folks, that, that, that accountability is going to be this. When we ask for it, then we will be accountable. You know, like when I say something like, look, I've got, um, I, I need to work on my, on my quiet time. I need to be more consistent in that. Well, at that point, and I say, I need your help, then they start being obnoxious about bugging me until I do it. But you've got to ask for it for me. But there comes the confrontation. You know, uh, we all have blind spots. And they're blind spots because we don't want to see that thing about ourselves. But there's nothing like a lifeboat that can show you those things. Because when they show it to you, you know they're not going to, they're going to, they're not going to break the relationship if you don't change. You know that they love you. I mean, up until now, everything they have done has, has, has well, you, you'd think they would take a bullet for you. But one time I remember they kind of, it was like this. It was like they held me to the ground and showed this thing about myself. They put it in front of my face. They forced my eyes open. They made me look at it. They just let me know on no uncertain terms. You want to know what it is, don't you? They were just saying, you're an ego freak, Ehler. And they made me look at that. Well, you know, when that stuff comes from people that love you, you can take it a whole lot easier. You know, when Paul said, correct one another in love, he didn't mean you just start the, well, as a pastor, we, we learn, we pastors learn real quick that when somebody comes up to you and says, pastor, we love you, but dive for cover, man, incoming. But man, when people have shown you that they love you, and you know that, and you know they're not going to desert you no matter how you react, you can take that stuff better. Now, I'm still an ego freak, but I've been, I'm a lot more polite about it. I'm not so obnoxious about it because I know I'm that. But man, there's nothing like a lifeboat that can do that. It just comes easier from people that you know love you. Also included a chapter on the support that you get in a lifeboat because there's nothing like it. Several years ago, I wrestled with depression. Uh, I don't, it was one of those depressions where I don't know why. You know, the family was good. The job was good. I couldn't put my finger on what was pulling me down. But man, I just couldn't get my chin off, my, off the ground. And my lifeboat got really concerned about me. They decided I needed some help. They just decided I needed to see somebody. But it was, this was my lifeboat. So, so they, didn't, they thought just some pastoral counselor or some psychiatrist wasn't going to work. We were going to go for the best. So uh, they went for James Dobson. Uh, if you know anything about the Christian psychological world, he used to be the top of the, I mean, he was the most famous. And so they jumped all these hoops to get me an appointment with James Dobson. I mean, there were a lot of hoops to jump. And the way they fixed it up, and I say, I'm, I'm depressed. I, I ain't got what it takes to line up any of this stuff. But I remember we got in the car. We drove to D.C. There was a big thing on the mall that day, a huge stage, little gobs and gobs of people. And uh, he was speaking. And when he finished speaking, they had me at the bottom of the steps of the stage. And as James Dobson came off the stage, uh, the, my friend that was with me introduced me. And then we started walking and, and he's, uh, we're kind of going through the conversation as we're walking and we walk and we walk and we walk. And finally we get to this car. We get in the back seat of this car. Some guy I'd never seen before is driving the car. He takes off. Uh, I'm still talking. We're talking. I don't know for how long. And then finally the car pulls over and the driver turns around and says, this is where you get out. The, the conversation was over. Well, I got out. I'm in the middle of Washington, D.C., tall buildings all around. I'm going, I don't know where I am. I'm thinking, how am I going to get home? I don't even know what direction to go. And then I look over, and there's Jay, leaning up against one of the buildings with his foot up like this, just arms crossed, just big grin on his face. He said, 
you need a way home, don't you? Well, he took me home. But you know, I don't remember anything that James Dobson said to me. Well, I do. I remember one thing. He said, because I was tall, I should play more basketball. I remember that. But you know, when you got people that love you like that, that will jump those kind of hoops for you, it is really hard to stay depressed for very long. The support that you get in a lifeboat is amazing. We lived in a neighborhood. It, it was one of those that um, lots of houses, big ring road. A lot of people used it as a racetrack, I think. A lot of kids in the neighborhood. In fact, while we lived there, two kids were hit by cars and killed. The first one happened not too long after we got there. And uh, it happened a few blocks from us. And I remember my neighbors going, hey, you're a pastor. You need to go see those people. I'm going, I ain't got nothing to offer those people. My gosh, they just lost their nine-year-old daughter. And then I learned that the couple, uh, the family went to our church. I'd just gotten to the church. It was 800 people. I didn't know everybody yet. So now I knew I had to go. And I remember walking down the street going, I have got nothing, nothing to offer these people. I have no relationship with it. I don't know what I'm going to say. What do you say to somebody that's been through something like that? And then I, I started up the sidewalk to their house, and, and I saw somebody cutting the grass. Got to the front door, and there's this person at the front door kind of keeping the reporters out and only letting friends in, and I had to sort of show my credentials, <laughs> tell them who I was before they let me in the house. I remember stepping into the house, and I'm in the foyer, and I'm looking into the living room, and on, in the living room, the mother of the child is sitting on the couch with these two ladies with her, and, you know, they're, they're crying together. I look over here in the dining room, and at the dining room table, there's two people with the kid, the other two kids that were in the family, and, and they're writing notes. I found out later they were writing notes to their sister, and they were going to tie them to balloons and let them go. But the real telltale was when I walked back into the den, because the father of, the, of that girl was sitting in his lazy boy, and on the, on the floor in front of him are two of his friends. And he is talking and talking and talking. You know, men don't do that in that kind of situation unless those two guys at their feet are really close friends. I remember walking out of that house thinking, man, I didn't add to that. But man, I am glad that that couple took the time and put the energy into building a lifeboat around them. That they gathered some friends and they built those relations to the place where they come to this kind of moment and they've got that kind of support. You know, when you get that telephone call that changes your life, your lifeboat will be the first people at your door and you'll be so, so glad to see him. You know, the big tragedy of the Titanic was that it didn't have enough lifeboats. And I'm afraid that in our Christian world right now, there's just not enough lifeboats. So I hope right now you'll make a decision in your life that I am going to build a lifeboat. If I've already got some friends and we're moving in that direction, I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to gather them together and say, hey, why don't we try to push one another to be more like we ought to be? And if you don't have that, start looking for those people that you can lifeboat with. Please, please. Please do this before you get that phone call that changes your life. Father, I know what we're talking about here scares the tar out of most people. I know the thought of, of letting people into their lives and letting this, them see the real them and, and really being honest and really opening up just scares us. I know the thought of, of taking on other people's problems just, oh, it scares us. But God, I also know that those kind of friendships 
make life worth living. That those kind of friendships give us the support and the encouragement that we can't get anywhere else. Oh Lord, help us to start right now building the lifeboats. To go ahead and launch those lifeboats. To make sure they don't leak. Surround us with friends that matter. Friends with purpose. Thank you, Lord. Amen.